Well, good morning. Okay, so I got new glasses. The earpieces are a little thick. So in order to wear this goofy little microphone thing, I got to take my glasses off. So I can't see any of you. <laughs> or the clock. <laughs> so if somebody's got a, well, what I was going to say, if, if you're sitting back there doing this, I'm not going to see it. So. So there was a, uh, so, so there was a preacher who got going one, one Sunday morning, and this is not in my notes, I can't read those either. <laughs> Got going one Sunday morning, and I mean, he's in the spirit, and he's letting it rip, and he'd been preaching for, you know, 20, 30 minutes, and so he'd gone about 10, 15 minutes beyond his normal time, and people are getting restless, and they're <clears throat> coughing and, and, you know, moving in their seats and, and just trying to let him know it's time to start wrapping it up, and boy, he just kept on going, and uh, so, you know, then he'd, he'd gone on, he'd preach about 45, 50 minutes, and people are starting to tap their watches, you got little alarms going off, beeping, they're trying to let him know, let's go, come on, let's get moving, we got to beat the Baptist to the restaurants for lunch. And he just keeps on going. This guy had been preaching for a good hour, 10, hour and 15 minutes, and finally Lonnie, one of the ushers in the back grabbed a hymnal and threw it. Well, he didn't throw it hard enough. And he hit this little old fellow sitting in the front row and knocked him out of the pew. Well, the preacher just keeps on going. He doesn't even see it. They run up and they roll the little old man over and he says, Hurry up and hit me again. I think I still hear him. <laughs> so... Being kingdom-minded, Jonathan's been designated this month, and we're talking about being kingdom-minded, understanding the kingdom of God, having a mindset that, that locks us in, makes us focus on this idea of the kingdom. And I've heard it said before, there are some people that are so, that are so kingdom, so heavenly-minded that they are no earthly good. There are some people that are so locked in on heaven and that kingdom and what is to come and what's going on out there that they're no good to anybody down here. And it makes me think of the, the, the story that you've all heard about the, the man who's sitting on the roof of a house during a flood and everything around him is, is water and, and, and just sunk and he's sitting on top of that house. Somebody comes by in a canoe and says, Come on, come on, let's go. We're here to, to pick you up. We're here to rescue. And he says, no, 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 God's going to take care of me. He told me he'd take care of me. So a little bit later, some, some guys come by in a, in a, in a, a, a swimming, and they got some floats and all this, and they're like, here, come on, we're here to take you. We're here to rescue you. And he says, no, 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 God promised he'd take care of me. And so then the, the helicopter comes in. And they're yelling to him to grab onto the rope, and they're there to rescue. Well, the, the man, same thing. God promised he'd take care of me. He'd rescue me. Well, the man died in the flood. And he gets to heaven, and he asks God, why didn't you rescue me like you told me you would? And God says, I tried three times. So this guy was so locked on to what he thought was this idea of these, these heavenly things. He was no earthly good. But then there are folks, you know, who are so earthbound that they're no heavenly good, that they miss out on the things of heaven. They miss out on the things of God. There was a young couple who got married. And listen, I'm just going to tell you, <clears throat> I've been to some weddings in the last, well, not in the last couple of years, but I've, I've been to some weddings in the last few years of, of young people, and I don't understand why they stay so long. And it's like, I want to go home. But the, the bride and groom, these young people, they're still there dancing and they're, they're with their friends. And I'm like, go, 
get out of here so I can leave. But they stay and they stay and they stay. And so <clears throat> this young couple did that. They're, 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 they just stayed. They wouldn't leave the reception. They finally leave. They head off on, for the honeymoon that night. They get to the hotel. It's late. It's dark. They're tired. They get to their hotel. They go up to the, to the room that they had reserved. They're expecting this big deal. They get in, and it's a tiny little room. Just a tiny little room, no bed, it's got a fold-out couch, a couple of chairs and a television, and they're just so disappointed because they were expecting something more of this honeymoon suite and what was, what was waiting for them. <clears throat> and the next morning they get up and the groom, the new husband, he goes down to the front desk to complain about this tiny little, we, we booked the, the, the bridal suite and we were expecting all of these amenities and this great big, this, this great big suite. He says, and all we got was this little fold-out couch and a couple chairs and a television and this, the, 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 the door to the closet, the little the closet there. And the man says, closet, he says, did you open that door? He said, well, no. They go back up to the room and he opens the door and on the other side, it's not the closet, it's the bedroom. And there's flowers everywhere and there's champagne. And, there's, and so, you see, they were, they were so locked in on the things of, of, of that that they, they didn't see what was waiting for them on the other side. They didn't bother to go. So, <clears throat> so to me, when Jonathan talks about being kingdom-minded, and when we think about kingdom-minded, it, it's knowing that, that like that, that new couple on their honeymoon, there's something far greater waiting for us on the other side of that door. There's something far better than what we've got here over there on that other side. We just got to be looking for it, but... Like that man on the, on the roof, we cannot be so focused in and locked in on what's coming on the other side that we forget about what great things are available to us right here, right here around us. It's, it's understanding, it's understanding, you know, like this, that church of God doctrine that says the kingdom of God is not some future event. The kingdom of God does not come after the rapture and the tribulations and the carrying away and all of the things that the uh, post and pre and all the just tribulationists and, and all the millennialists and all of that believe. The kingdom of God was established 2,000 years ago when Christ ascended and the Holy Spirit descended, and the kingdom of God exists because God reigns in the hearts and the minds of his people. The kingdom of God is now. Man, I sounded southern, didn't I? It's now. I deal with that, you know. I talked to a friend of mine from high school the other day, and I, li I live down here, I've been down here ooh, a long time. And people say, I'm surprised. You've lived in the South all this time and you haven't picked up an accent. And then I talk to my friends up North and they're like, holy cow, you've picked up an accent. So I guess it's all relative. If you have your Bibles, turn over to the book of Matthew. Jonathan's been preaching to you from the, or he started last week from the book of Matthew. We're going to be looking at the book of, of Matthew, the 25th chapter about these different parables that talk about the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of God is like and what the kingdom of God is all about. So the 25th chapter, if you're there, and we're going to start in the 14th verse, and it says, for the kingdom of heaven, got it? The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is like this. It's like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Now, I'm going to read this whole thing, so bear with me. Then he said, uh, uh, and to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went out on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. 
And likewise, he who had received two gained two more. But he who had received just one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So, so he who had received five talents came and brought his five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You see where we're going here? I know you've read, heard this all before. But you, you can kind of see there's, there's going to be a pattern here. He also, he also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. And his Lord said to him, you're ready for this? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have made, I've made you ruler of, uh, I will make you ruler over many things. Oh, he says, you've been a talented, over, faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you are a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered. And I was afraid, and I went, and I hid your talent. I hid it in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. And he handed him back that one. Oh, but the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you all ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast, uh, and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus tells this parable. We've all heard it before. This guy's going on a trip. Rich guy, he's got some talents. He gives five to one servant, two to another, one to a third. He says, I'll be gone, take care of my money. When he comes back, the guy who had five, he had worked it. Whatever he did, he got five more. Guy who had two, he did the same thing, worked it, got two more. Guy who had one, he buried it. When the guy got back, here's your money back. He gave me that one, I took care of that one. Man, we're good to go. And the, the, the guy, the rich man, is like, well, this is not the way it works. This is not how I want it to work. You should have done like the others. You should have made money. So we read this, this parable and... and we think about stewardship, and, and what Jonathan wanted, had suggested to me was read this and, and start looking and thinking about how we should be stewards, how being kingdom-minded, understanding that the kingdom of God is now, that the kingdom of God is in the hearts and minds of his people, and understanding that being kingdom-minded means being stewardship-minded means being stewards of what's been given to us. It means what this, this rich man, this ruler had done, he had claimed, uh, 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 proclaimed to these uh, servants to be stewards of what he had given them. So to be stewardship-minded is to be kingdom-minded. However, you know me, I got to see things from another. I just can't do the same thing over and over. It's like Mendy's restaurant. If, if you, anybody ever watched Seinfeld, Jerry's friend Banyan, they were going to go out to eat. And he says, well, we can go to Mendy's. It's good, but it's the same. Or we can go somewhere different. Might not be as good, but it's different. So I can't tell you how good this is going to be, but it's going to be different. <laughs> Do you really need another sermon? On, on stewardship of your money and your resources? Do you, really, do you really need me to stand up here and go on and on to you about being a, a good steward of the money that God has given to you? Do you need to hear from me one more time about giving to the church and about tithing and about offerings and about supporting missions and about supporting you know, the building campaigns and supporting all of the things that go on in the church. 
do you need another one of those? Maybe. Maybe you do. I don't know what's going on with y'all, but maybe you do, but that's not what you're getting today. Do you need a... Do you need another sermon about giving to the poor and spending wisely? Well, you're not getting it if you do. Do I need to go into, be, into one more sermon about being good stewards of our talents? And I, I appreciate it in your prayer that, that we, uh, you mentioned how thank, thankful to God we are for Wayne and for Debbie and for those who to use their singing talents and their musical talents and those kind of things in the church. And we are thankful for them. Do you really need to hear me preach another sermon about singing in church, about using your musical abilities, about using your artistic abilities, about using your teaching abilities, about whatever it is? Do I need to go on about singing, playing, cleaning, cooking, gardening, building? I wrote in my notes, ciphering those who do the, the books and the money. Do you need me another sermon about using your talents? Well, you might, but you're not getting it. Do I need to give you another sermon on being a good steward of your time? We all have been given a certain amount of time. We got to give some of that time to the church. We owe some of that time to our family, to work. We have time. We only have 24 hours a day, and we're, we're expected to use that and use it wisely. Do you need me to preach to you about that? Well, you might, but you're not going to hear it. You all know, I, I guess you could say, you all know the drill, right? We all know the drill, as they say. Be good stewards of your money. Be good stewards of your time. Be good stewards of your talents. That's what this parable, we've been preached to about this parable all these years. Colonel Bruce Bright <clears throat> commanded, there's only a few actual fighter uh, groups, platoons, what you would call in the, in the, in the Marines, in their air wing, their, among their, their aviators. A guy named Colonel Bruce Bright from right here in Birmingham commanded one of those squadrons. He's a great guy, really cool guy. And I met him a few years ago. We've talked several times, and he spoke at one of our luncheons, and, and I got him to come speak at one of the conferences I'm a part of. And anyhow, Colonel Bright now tells a story about his life and some changes he made, and I really understand him. So what he did was he says, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a white man, born here in Alabama, born on this date, in this year. And he started doing the research, and he says, this is the life expectancy. And by the way, there's only two, just so you all know, there's only two states in the union, in the United States, that have a lower life expectancy for white males than Alabama. That's Mississippi and West Virginia. Uh, I mean, we're, those of us who live here, us white guys, we're not expected to live long. I think it's all the, the what do we cook everything in? Lard and it's, yeah, everything's fried. And man, all the barbecue we eat. Oh. Anyhow, he figured out life expectancy. He said, this is how long I am expected to live. He says, so he did some math. Well, I did the math. My life expectancy here in Alabama is 71.7 years. I really think I can do better than that. I really do, so I round it up to 80. <laughs> right? So, 80 years old. I am 55 right now, and this is, this is sort of his math. He did the math, but this is sort of his thinking. I am 55 years old. If I live to be 80... I have 1,275 Saturdays left. I refuse to spend those Saturdays doing stuff I don't want to do with people I don't want to do it with. He said he figured this all out and he started to write a book about it. And one day his wife says to him, Bruce, let's go do such and such with this couple. And he said, nope, I'm not doing it. Why? Because I don't want to do that, and even if I did, I don't want to do it with them. This is one of my Saturdays, and I am not wasting it that way. I get that. Do you get it? You get, I mean, sometimes 
we got to do things we don't want to do with people we don't want to do them with. But if I can at all help it, I'm not going to. I get it. So I believe that to be good stewards of what we got left, those 1,275 Saturdays I got left, those years that are left, if I can make it to 80, hopefully I'll live longer than that. I really, I got to, this is off notes, I got a call the other day from my insurance people about my life insurance policy, about increasing my life insurance policy. And I said, no. And they couldn't, she couldn't, but what? But you have a mortgage on a house, it'll be fine. She said, don't you want to leave something to your son? And I said, no. <laughs> I don't want Grant Robinson to profit from my death. He's got a job. He can sell the house. There's enough money there to take care of my, you know, to ship me to the body farm or whatever he decides to do with me. I work with, da some of you know that David Sellers and I work together, and David said one day, we we're talking about retirement. There are three of us who do what he and I do, and we're all the same age. We're all going to retire right at the same time if, if we make it that long. And David said, I'll probably use, I'll probably work a few years past retirement, make sure my kids are taken care of. And I said, I got to work till I die to make sure I'm taken care of. But with that time I got left, I got to be a good steward of that one gift that God has given me that is greater than any other gift he's given me. I got to take care of me. I've got to be a good steward of me. And you have got to be good stewards of you. You can't be a good steward of your talents and your time, and your money, if you're not a good steward of you. So I made a few notes. A few years ago, I was, uh, I was asked to, to come up with a motivation, be a motivational speaker. Not live in a van down by the river, but to be a motivational speaker. And uh, I wrote out this, this program, and I got all PowerPoint and all that stuff, and it's about growth. So in order to grow, you got these, you know, it's a, each letter stands for something. I even used it at the state youth convention. Ethan might remember this, about growing. But the G stands for this. In order to grow, the first thing you got to do with that G is you got to get up, get out, and get going. In order to take care of yourself, the first thing, the first thing that you've got to do is be a good steward of, of your body, of you as a person. Get up, get out. We as human beings, are not designed to be sedentary. Just like that, uh, that uh, servant who buried that talent, we are not meant to be buried. We're not meant to be planted somewhere and just sit there. God wants us to get out and get moving. I told somebody the other day, man, I never, when I was young, I never pictured myself as that guy who's getting up at five o'clock in the morning and go into the gym three times a week and man I was right <laughs> I'm not that guy forget that and I'm not advocating that you be that guy or gal or whatever man or woman I'm not advocating you get up and I'm not telling you to run a 5K or run a marathon. Hey, you've all seen those little stickers that some people have on the back of their car, the, what is it, 23 point, what is it? What's a marathon, 23 point, what is it? Okay, whatever, 26.3, whatever it is. I want one on the back of my car that says 0.0. .0. <laughs> I'm, Philip, you know. If I can get to second base, I'm winded. But you've got to take care of this, this thing that you are. You've got to do stuff. You've got to get out there and, and do stuff. Matt, I think it would be so great for your health if you would just travel some. 
I'd love to see that. I'd love to see Matt Nelson start traveling. Seriously, travel. Go places. Even if it's just down the road to see something in Alabama that you've never seen before, do it. Get out there. Go. Garden. I don't garden. Lonnie, you garden. I don't garden. I don't plant stuff. But, but I, I like those people who do. Walk. Play. Take care of you. Look, I think that for some people, the convenience of, of home delivery for foods and groceries and stuff like that is great. But for some people, it's made them lazy. Look, just go to the grocery if you don't do anything else. Get moving. Do stuff. Take care of you. Take care of the physical you that God has given you. Eat well. Eat well. Eat, eat well. Now, I know I probably don't, and I'm trying hard. But like I said, we live in the South. It's hard to eat healthy down here. And I like those meat and threes. And I, you know, I do. And, and, I've got a couple friends who eat healthy. They're working on this whole vegetarian lifestyle. (laughs) Talking about tofu. I I will tell you I have discovered the best way to prepare tofu. Open the package, dump it in the trash, (laughs) and fix something else. But eat well. Eat well. Where's Paul? Is he still in here? Oh, he's out back. Man, if he can hear me, Paul, buy those shoes. You know, I, I'm not talking about wasting money, dressing, extra, uh, you know, outrageously or being extravagant. But man, a couple of years ago, I was in Austin, Texas. I had a little money in my pocket from my Christmas bonus. I went into a place in Austin called Allen's, and I tried on some cowboy boots. Well, yeah, I got five pair now. (laughs) I thought, well, but something said buy them. You'll be fine. And I'm fine. Buy those shoes. Take a day off. Nobody, Nobody, when you die, nobody ever gets up at your funeral and says, man, that guy worked every day. What a great guy. He was always, take a day off. Honestly, take them off. I have vacation time, and in the last two years I've burned time because I just didn't take a day off. Take a day off. Take care of you. Sleep in if you can. And listen to this. Hug people. Two, these are my two last two things about taking care of the physical you. Number one, hug people. I am so glad we can hug people again. I am whole, so tired of the fist bump. I'm ready to hug people. Doesn't a hug make you feel good? It makes other people feel good? Unless there's some nutcase that's still the people that are driving around in their car with masks and rubber gloves on. Don't even get near those, but normal people, give them a hug. Hugging is great. It will make you feel good. Do things that make you feel good physically. That's what God wants from us because we cannot take care of our talents and our time and our money and be stewards of those if we don't take care of this. My last little story. So this week I'm in Mobile and I was feeling run down. I, I'm there with my work, it's a long story, feeling kind of run down, run into the ground, overworked, a lot of junk going on. On my, my last stop in Mobile before I hit the road to come home, it's in Criola. It's a little fabricating and welding and machine shop. I go to the front door and I open the front. It's a little, just a little tiny little building outside the, this big you know, facility. And I go into the office there where the office is. I open the front door and I step in and it's a hallway. And it's probably as far as from me to Steve down this hallway, and there's offices on either side, and at the end of that hallway is a little Pomeranian. And he looks at me. And he just stands there looking at me, and I stand there looking at him. Now, there was no bell or beeper to let anybody know I had walked through the door, just me and the Pomeranian. He looks this way, and he looks this way, 
And then he comes over to me, and he gets right here in front of me, and he looks up. And I swear to you, he said, there's nobody else around. If we both keep quiet, you can pet me as long as you want. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> Finally, a guy comes out of one of the offices, and he looks, and he says, he yells down the hall to the woman in the other office. He says, have you heard bark? Bark? And she says, no. And he goes, there's a guy down there patting him. <laughs> Apparently, Bart, bark, bark, barks, bleh, Bart barks at everybody that comes through the door. But me, I looked like a patsy. Well, this guy will pet me. If I just keep my mouth shut, he'll pet me. And I did. That was, you know what, maybe I was rejuvenated. I could have gone and visited three or four more job sites. I was feeling good. I got to pet a dog. I'm just going to tell you, hug people, pet dogs. Pet every dog that you can. It'll make you feel better. Take care of you. Do not bury that one thing. Do not plant in the ground and hide that one great gift that God has given you. Second thing I want you to know is that God wants us to be good stewards of our mind. Fill your mind with good stuff. The Bible says, Paul says, be ye transformed by the renewing of what? Your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Learn stuff. Take care of the, the gray matter. Take care of your brain. Learn things. Read good books. Read good books. Listen to good music. Watch documentaries. I am a documentary junkie. I don't care what it is. I caught myself watching a documentary about potato chips, about the history of the snack food industry. This thing was an hour and a half long, and I'm just, wow, I had no idea. But now I know stuff. I know stuff about the Frito Empire and the Lay's Empire and how they got together and corn chips and potato chips, and man, I know it. Watch documentaries, read good books, listen to good music, visit museums, play those stupid little word games on your phone. Keep your mind going. Spend time thinking. I do a lot of driving, and sometimes I'm listening to music, and sometimes I'm listening to documentary or uh, listening to books, uh, audio books. Um, I love audiobooks because it's like it's somebody reading to me, which is, man, that's, that's like if I could pet a dog while somebody read to me, that's heaven right there. But, but I listen to audiobooks, and you know what? I never thought I would be a podcast guy, but I actually am. I'm listening to podcasts, anything that I can learn. But you know, sometimes I just turn it off and I will drive for an hour in silence and just think. Just think, think. Do those that keep your mind active. Think about stuff. If nothing else, find a YouTube video and learn how to splatter paint. But just do something to keep your mind active. God wants us to keep our minds. We cannot be kingdom-minded if our minds are not being kept active. So that's the second thing. Be good stewards of your mind. And finally this, be a good steward of your spirit. Be a good steward of your spirit, of your soul. And I'll tell you two things, two ways to do that. First of all, get connected, get involved, and get in with other people. Be involved with people. I, I, you know, I got this whole thing about social media. I, and I, you know, I know Jonathan mentions every once in a while social media, Instagram, Facebook, whatever, whatever, all kinds of uh, social media. But I have a Facebook page, and <clears throat> when people start posting things on there, and I my pages filled with my friends saying political stuff and social stuff and all that. I just block, I don't block, but I just, I delete those. I hide those posts. I don't want to see those. You know what I want to see? I want to see pictures of your dog. That's what I want to see. I want to see your vacation pictures. I want to see pictures of your kids and your grandkids 
at music recitals, at ball games, stuff like that. I want to hear about your life. I want to know what you're doing. I want to know what's going on with you. I don't care about your political views. Well, I mean, I do, but I don't. But, but get connected with people. It shouldn't be anti-social media. It should be social. It's about finding out what's going on in people's lives. It's about being connected. Let's get connected. Let's get involved with other human beings. I actually wrote in my notes to spread yourself around. Get out there. Hug people. Talk to people. The church, the early church used, we talk about fellowship, right? Fellowship. There's your good southern one. We all going to get together in fellowship. It's not about a carrying dinner. Fellowship is not necessarily a linger longer or an ice cream social. The word that the Bible uses, the New Testament uses for fellowship, am I right, is koinonia. And you go back and you look at the, what the koinonia was about. It wasn't about them getting together and having a meal. It was about them being invested in each other's lives. Man, I look around this congregation and I look at, I have a 25-year-old son and I look at all of the men in this congregation who have been role models for him over the years, who invested in his life. I nearly broke out, nearly cried that day of his Eagle Scout deal when he gave his mentor pins to David and Pat. Men that I respect, who he respects. We get involved. We get involved with each other. We're involved and we make an investment in each other's children and grandchildren and, and brothers and sisters and lives. That is the koinonia. And you get involved and you get connected with people and that will strengthen and that will build your spirit. And that is being a good steward of the spirit that God has put within you. Right? Wrong? I don't know. I'm cheering for all of you. I make jokes all the time about how I hate people, you know, but I don't. I love people. I like being around people, and I love each and every one of you, and I am rooting for you to succeed. Lonnie, I want your garden this year to be a better garden than you have ever had before. Brother Absher, next time you fish, I want you to catch everything that you can catch till that boat is do what praise the Lord. Praise the, exactly somebody told me the other day when i went to the elementary school to read to the fourth graders over there that the kids love mr bowman and that he is a great teacher that makes me feel good i'm rooting for you I want you to succeed. Every time I see you post stuff about Caleb, that makes me happy. I want him to succeed. I want you guys to succeed. Ethan, no, I'm kidding. I want you to succeed. Whatever it is that you are doing, I'm rooting for you. And that's the fellowship. That's the coin of you. That's the fellowship of the church is that we root for each other. Right? I want you all to do really well. I want me to do well too, but I really want you to do well. We cheer for each other. Connect with each other and get involved. That's how we're good stewards of our spirit. But the final thing is this. Connect with God and let Him connect with you. That is being a good steward of our spirit, of our soul. And, and like I said, you don't need another sermon on being a steward of your money and your time and your talents, just like you probably don't need for me to stand up here for another 15, 20 minutes and talk about Bible reading and daily prayer. We know it, right? We know that's what we do. That's how we stay in touch. That's how we stay connected with God is through Bible reading and prayer. I don't need to preach to you about that because you know it. But I am going to remind you that being a good steward of your spirit and your soul means staying connected with God through our Bible readings and our prayer. I got three books that I carry in my car at all times. 
One of them is the government uh, document, the 1926 OSHA standard for construction, for, for construction. I know that like the back of my hand. No, I'm just kidding. It's boring. But I keep one in my car. I keep a copy of the U.S. Constitution. I know. I'm a goofball, right? But anytime somebody wants to argue with me about what's in the Constitution, I say, let me get mine. <laughs> Argument usually ends right there because they don't have one. <laughs> okay? And my Bible. And I, it was great to hear Jonathan talk about his Bible that's fallen apart because mine is fallen apart. It's hard to get a new one when you're so into that. Stay in prayer and stay in the Bible. Be good stewards of your spirit. So finally, I'll just end with that. Live that abundant life. Live that abundant. Jesus said that I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest, to have it more abundantly. It depends on what translation you're, you're reading. But, but Jesus came so that we could have a good life. He's given us these talents. He's given us this time. He's given us this money for us to be stewards of. But we can't be stewards of that until we're good stewards of this. Take care of your body. Take care of you, the person that you are. Go do stuff. Take care of your mind. Read. <laughs> Listen to good music, d d study, learn, and be a good steward of your spirit and your soul. Connect to God and, and connect to others and stay connected to Him. Amen? Let's stand. Father, thank you for this day.